Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our Nancy Drew Games review series where we are ranking every single Nancy Drew game on six key aspects, being the story and premise of each game, the suspects, the puzzles, the music, the atmosphere, and the ending. I'm your host, Jameson. And I'm Julian. What's going on, everybody? And today we are joined by Sylvia once again to review Secret of the Old Clock. It's great to be back here, guys. You guys know I love Nancy Drew. I love the the Golden Age, which this one's right in the smack dab in the middle of. Yes. I love that era of Nancy Drew games, so. Very true. Now, I just want to clear up real quick. Uh, this review has taken us forever to make because for some reason I could not get old clock to work on my regular computer. You know, like I could get Stay Tuned for Danger to work eventually, but not old <laughs> clock. So we actually had to record this one off of a different computer, and we still don't have a working long play that's not all glitchy. But we have the raw footage of the video without any sound, so that's good enough for a review. That being said, this is our final review until game 34 comes Ooh. out. It's so sad to say it, but we've got the ranking series coming up, and that's going to be... Yeah, there's still a lot to look forward to. Stay tuned for that, folks. We'll get into that more later. Otherwise, I think that's about all that can be said. Uh, Secret of the Old Clock. You want to get in the story and premise? Well... Let's kick things off in the 1930s Nancy Drew world, because that's where this game takes place. If you didn't know, this game is kind of going off the really old school Nancy Drew vibes that was in the original Carolyn Keene books. And in this regard, it's very, very different. It's like, I've always questioned, like, how does this fit in with the other games? Is this like chronological? It doesn't. <laughs> well, actually, in Alibi and Ashes, they've got like a throwaway oh, yeah. line almost where they're like, there oh. hasn't been this much excitement in the town since old man Crowley's will was found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my like god, that. you know, that's right. Of course, that is I, don't know, I don't know when Titusville becomes River Heights, but. <laughs> Moving on to the story and premise, Nancy's friend Emily Crandall, she's in a bit of a pickle right now. She's 17 years old and she just lost her mother, and she is about to inherit a inn that is pretty famous for their blueberry pies, they're all types of pies. Anyways, the Great Depression is right in the thick of it all, and she's about to inherit an inn. She just lost her mother, and she's befallen very hard times. But things really start to kick off when Nancy arrives. There's a fire and like an explosion in the kitchen as Nancy's going to console her. And when we arrive back, all of her jewelry is gone that was her mother's. So the I think that's where the mystery initially starts off. Yeah, the reason that she calls Nancy out in the first place is that because she wants Nancy to take her mother's jewels and put them in a safety deposit box in case she ever really needs the funds. And it should also be mentioned that uh, Jane, or that uh, Emily is being looked after by Jane Willoughby, her legal guardian, for like only the next three months until she turns 18. Then she's on her own. Jane's the first person you talk to. Sylvia, what are your initial impressions of Jane? Or, I'm doing hand quotes right now. Jane. Well, yeah, I, well, thing. obviously, I, yeah, I don't like her. I, she's, she's sort of like, she just looks really out of place i mean that purple dress like the polka dots just make oh. make her look sort of wild looking and the, that hair something big that i think is easily awarded to this game i would call this the corniest cheesiest nancy drew by far yeah yes but it's yeah. it's totally like a non sequitur of all the other games it's it, you know it doesn't fit in anywhere chronologically and it just has a really goofy atmosphere to it for the most part. Mm. There's just all this crazy slapstick screwball music from the 1930s. And really everything that the characters say will just like eventually make you go crazy when you just hear horse feathers for the 19th time. So. <laughs> the last thing that we need to touch on in story and premise is that her neighbor also passed away, Josiah Crowley. And he was this corny old man, and every single time she tells a story about him, like, I just wish he was a guy I could meet. He sounds amazing. He's this nutty old guy who occasionally dresses up as old women. But the takeaway is that he really took after Emily, and he definitely gave her the impression that with his passing she would be left well off in the will but lo and behold when the will came out all of the proceeds went to sir richard topham yes sir the one and only and so that's really suspicious that's like throwing a ton of evidence on this character that we haven't even met right now at the beginning of the game but that's all you really need to know that's where the old clot thing comes in is because his favorite saying is whenever he would be asked about his will what is it? The clocks will tell. Time will time tell. Will tell. Are you time kidding will me? Talk. That's the yeah. easiest thing to remember. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, let's get into suspects now. So we might as well finish off Jane Willoughby right now. Her whole purpose before the end game just seems entirely satirical. Everything she says is just in such a dumb, just 1930s like flapper. A dumb voice. Dora. So she's just like the. She's just like the like 
front desk person of the inn slash restaurant mm-hmm. that doesn't have an inn actually and also doesn't have a restaurant anymore. So I don't know what she's doing there. Did she say she was from New York City or somewhere and she got called in because of uh, like Brooklyn or something? Gloria's death. I yeah. don't know. It's but Sylvia touched on something interesting, and that's I do think her interactive like research like just thirties slang or something. And they that just... or they just made it up with wanton disregard. But uh, we mentioned her briefly. Do you want to talk about Emily Crandall? Um, yes. So she's Nancy's friend. Uh, Nancy sent her a card after her mom passed away. Um, And briefly, I'm going to just cover the mom so we can just get on with it. Um, Her mom is the one who is actually friends with Josiah Crowley. Um, Like, for example, after Josiah Crowley died, she asked for his hat for something to remember him by. Because, of course, after he died, all of his stuff went to Topham, but yeah. Topham gave him the hat. Yeah, basically, she just dies, and uh, that just leaves poor Emily without much guidance, because I think she's only 17. It's not much of a character transformation, but about th- midway through the game, she starts to think she's going insane, too. Like, she's starting to hear voices in the painting in her room. She thinks she saw the eyeballs blink. It comes later on in the game, but I recall she's like, Nancy, I think things would be better off if you just left. I'm just losing it here. Just let me inherit this this little inn and live my life. And, like, I, it, what I get from her is somebody who's given up on life, pretty much. Something that I just thought of is when she's going crazy and she's, like, telling you to shh. There's this extreme zoom in on her face as she's, like, looking from left to right around the room. She feels like... Really, I feel like she's getting stalked or something. I don't know. Emily Crandall is definitely on edge through the entire game, and you can feel it. Okay, so we ought to get on to Richard Topham now. Uh, Richard Topham, you know, I can honestly probably give him the award of best suspect in this game. Richard Topham is this weird kooky psychic who is now the neighbor. He moved into Josiah's old house, and his entire thing is just... uh, I think it's actually symbolic because even his profession is built on lies, and all the stuff that he inherited is based off of a lie, you know? So that kind of goes hand in hand. I'm just making that connection, which is interesting. Going off the whole thing that he's like a scam artist is, I thought this was interesting and they didn't put much emphasis on it, but right when, the first time you meet him, you walk in the door, he goes, hello, Miss Drew. And Nancy's bewildered. She's like, how did you know my name? And he's like, whatever he says, oh, your telepathic energy told me. I don't for- I forget, it's something corny. Yeah, and then they say later on, he just showed up at the inn when uh, the explosion happened and asked whose car that was was to Jane and Jane told him. Yeah, I thought that that's interesting foreshadowing that he's like built off of lies. He's got a cat named Yuri. Uh, maybe it's a call back to Yuri Danner from game two. Who knows? Could be. Yeah, but regardless, Yuri is a little whiny pug nosed cat that you need to find Yuri's toy whenever you enter into Topham's house so that he stops meowing. Otherwise, it uh, infringes on Topham's brainwaves. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else we need to touch on for Mr. Topham here? I, I think we're ready to move on to Mr. Quintessential, the best suspect in the game who was totally necessary. <laughs> oh boy. So yeah, Jim Archer. This guy is, uh, Julian and I, I think both decided he didn't need to exist at all. I think he has the case for one of the worst suspects of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not even that he's a bad suspect, he's just so non-essential. He's, listen, he's a nice guy. He's, he's just a simple banker, just a simple elite man trying to make it in the Great Depression. I mean, okay, to be fair, bankers did get unfairly hit, and he's probably, like, the only real, like, tie to the Great Depression. Like, what's, what's 1930s about, like, a psychic, a fake psychic guy, (laughs) and, like, two chicks in a pie restaurant? Like, he, he, this guy, man... Like, the animation of him, like, getting the phone call and being like, oh, man. And then he shakes it off, uh-huh. and he's back to being fake cheery again. And he's like, Nancy, I gotta tell you the truth. We aren't doing too good. And it's like, yeah, buddy, I know. What's interesting about his character is that Josiah Crowley also promised him a good portion of his will. But it wasn't under Josiah Crowley. It was under old... What's her name? Shoot. Oh my. Clara. Clara. Yeah, Sylvia got it. Clara. And there's a really funny, I can't tell if it's a drawing or a picture of her, but it's obviously Josiah Crowley in disguise. And that's so funny. And that's actually where the real will is. And Clara is safe box. Yeah. That is so, that's so great. Okay. Josiah Crowley was gay, right? In this I always thought, I always thought that Topham was like, okay. Yeah. He was his psychic teacher, but like, okay. Topham lived in his house. Come on. I don't know if he was gay with Topham, but he was totally gay. I mean, he was like a theater kid all the way up to his 50s and 60s, so yeah. that's, that says enough. Fellas, is it gay to dress as a woman and then 
send a framed picture to the homies. All as part of an elaborate, <laughs> like an elaborate treasure hunt to get to your will. There's nothing gay about that. You know, you, when you first meet Jim Archer, this isn't so much of a spoiler. He gives you the illusion that uh, you know business is booming, a lot of banks are getting hit, but he's doing pretty fine. He's doing pretty fine. And then uh, towards the end of the game, he confesses, uh, yeah, I'm totally bankrupt, and like my entire business is about to get repossessed by another bank, and I'm just trying to make my wife this dress because uh, it's the last nice thing she's gonna have for a while. So harsh because yeah, I I knew I knew that he was like dead broke, and I tried to like be nice about it, but there's just no like Nancy's like, okay, so how are you gonna pay for that? And it's just, it's harsh. You've got to, like, confront him about his finances no matter what. I tried to be nice about it, but no. Nancy's the queen of asking insensitive questions. Oh, yeah. For sure. Otherwise, I think that about wraps up suspects. We'll probably make offhand comments about them as we go on, but that's that's the essential information. So, moving into puzzles now. Uh, I, I remember we had a lot of opinions on puzzles the first time we did this. Uh, may I suggest first as it sort of bleeds from characters into puzzles, the driving puzzle mini game yeah, thing. Yeah, very fair. Just the, just, it's multiple puzzles broken into it, but one of the main functions of it is it lets you access the town of Titusville. Um, the map is worthless, don't, you like, 50-50 on if the location you're looking for is going to be on the map, but, you know, um, it's this, like, big sprawling map with all these weird freaky corner turns there's no other cars you can't crash there's parked cars but you can go and visit all these still images of the 1930s and then hear voices so in effect like what the closed door of hotchkiss's room in the first half of treasure in the royal tower that's just that for like the whole game and they're all like there's like the funniest one is obviously clarence in the pine cone yeah. we stand forever <laughs> but there's also there's like a reference to Friday the 13th. There's like a reference to um, the what's the one with the man eating plant, the musical? Oh, uh, Little Gift Shop of Horrors. Yes, yeah. Okay, I have one more comment, and then Jamie's gonna say something about driving around. Yes. But uh, the big puzzle for driving is I don't I didn't really care for it honestly. Which is the huge sequence of events of doing a chore for this person, which leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to this, and it's all for jo Josiah's trivets. In that, getting the trivet back, there's a bunch of other mini puzzles, like you need to get six dolls, which you can just use your money on, but you also need to catch a 18 inch fish, and there's a bunch of little trivial yeah. things they throw in there like that. Those okay, are... okay, so there is something that I noticed in this game on the uh, the replay of it that drove me absolutely insane, and it's, it's going to take a little while to get into, so I'm going to go ahead and start off with this. One of the more infamous puzzles in this game is Mr. Topham's psychiatric riddles and stuff like that to evaluate whether or not your brainwaves are inferior and henceforth deleterious to his. <laughs> and so what he does is he gives you this little pamphlet of brain teasers, and the first time you play this game, this puzzle sucks. You will not be able to understand what the hell he wants you to do it is so confusing because it's literally just like a piece of paper that just has the word cheese in giant letters and you're <laughs> supposed to like respond with something at the bottom for points off in the first place for any puzzle that makes you type out an answer because you got to be like perfect to a t sometimes or else you won't get it right it's just discouraging what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to look at these brain teaser letters, like the word wet written 64 times, or like the word doll written from the bottom to the top, and you realize, oh, that cheese in giant letters, that's supposed to mean big cheese, and wet 64 times, that's all wet, and this one is doll up, and stuff like that. And there's a couple others, and really, once you, once you do this puzzle once, you learn it for life, and you always remember like, oh yeah, I know how this works. Now here's the thing. For the people who don't get spoilers, I always thought, isn't this just kind of a heartless puzzle that they never really put in a good hint for it? To kind of like, subliminally plant in the player's mind how to understand what these things mean? It was clever. Well, no. I'm- <laughs> I hated it so much. Here's, here's what's driving me crazy. Whenever you go out and deliver tubby telegrams, you get one of these little spiels from these 1930 2D characters and the screens and everything, and they have all their corny dialogue, and then, uh, God, I, I, it all started when Seymour from Blenheim Nursery 
What, what was it that he said? He said that, uh, oh, I was expecting some sort of delivery from this new oil baron or whatever coming to town. He's a real big cheese. And I'm just like, huh, that, that's quite the coincidence. And then I go to deliver the second telegram. And it's at the uh, Camp Avondale Lake. And the counselor shouts in the distance, oh, go dry up, Dry Jason. up. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I just about had like an aneurysm when I was just like, oh, my God. Every single telegram person uses one of Topham's stupid lingo. I'm just, I, I called Julian over and it's like, Hey, okay, go take this to the old observatory up on the hill. Listen to what this guy says. And he, he said double cross. <laughs> yeah, he says, Oh, I don't, don't want this guy to double cross me or whatnot. And God. It, so you don't like it, but I kind of think it's clever. It's clever, it's, but it doesn't do the tied job. In, it's tied into the other, the other, like the secondary puzzle um, where you have to, he's like, okay, your brain waves are awesome, so you're going to prove that I can read minds. And so he forces you to just play this matching game and you have to get five in a row. Um, and I think the game eventually gets, like, goes easy on you and has him duplicate it a yeah, lot because yeah. that's what happened to me in my playthrough. But he'll just, he'll do like verbal cues. And um, depending on which one it is, it might be one of the five cards that he's holding. And it's a little, like, trickier, but, like, it's just sort of, like, if Topham went around the town, that's probably how he, like, he just probably sub subconsciously picked it up and was like, oh, yes, I'll make a puzzle out of this. You see, I, I the can... brainwave people. I can forgive that one, almost, because the game has mercy on you in the second half. This is not mercy. <laughs> this stupid, just subliminally planting these 1930s catchphrases and stuff into your mind like oh my god for the longest time i always wondered why they went through the trouble of having all these corny extra cheesy voice actors to be fair though it does make the town feel a lot more full could you imagine if this game was like didn't have like all the different voices and like background noises and like the yeah. photos to look at it like it added a lot to the game just minecraft villager noises yeah, and I mean, it, there's like a whole little economy in this little like town, and there's the river, and there's the pond, and there's the railroads, you know, and you can go to all these different places, and it's like, it honestly, it is like a little like slice of the 1930s. It's like, it is a little bit fun to just deliver some telegrams, but only until you have enough money that you need, and then you stop. Mini golf. Mini golf, yeah. yes. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about mini golf. I think it's a real hit or miss. I've seen some people who actually like it, but I feel like the majority doesn't like it. I, and it's because it's like a flaw in the game design. If you ever have your mini ball in like the corner or close to a wall in general that's close to the side of your screen, you can just barely get a little hidden. And it's a total waste of a swing. And in mini golf, especially if you're playing on senior mode, which is a huge gap between junior mode, it's a 21 you need on senior and a 30 on junior, then every swing counts and like that can really get you. Yes, and there are secret, like, there's multiple, like, secret holes that will allow you to sco score, like, a hole in two or something on, like, some of the longer courses. I love um, it. You'll have to, you will, you will have to look at a walkthrough. Um, I mean, if, I guess if you're looking at this anyways, you're gonna get spoiled. But, like, if you're, if you wanna, if you wanna make par, you might have to figure out where at least one of those shortcuts are. Sometimes you might find it on accident and you're like, whoa, free hole in one. I, I didn't make par the first time, but then the second time I got it, so I don't know. I, I sort of feel like sort of like an urge to just go and boot up old clock and just play like just like one round of mini golf. Also, fun fact, if you do enjoy mini, mini golf, you can get a total bargain and skimp out the kids at the orphanage by just getting five pony. The kids will hate you, but they're eating pine cones anyway, so um, just give them a golf, a golf course pony. It's easy. I, I personally really like mini golf. Actually, it brought me back to the old days of Webkin's mini golf online. That, mm. That's that's what I always associated it with. But enough about mini golf. Uh, there are four clocks that used to belong to Josiah Crowley hidden around the game, and they mm -hmm. all have very simple but fun puzzles in them. One of them is just like a matching puzzle. Another one is a slider puzzle. Uh, you know, a classic kind that you haven't seen in a long time. One is a cool combination lock on a clock that has to do with a poem. That's you get as a reward for a mini golf puzzle and then the one in Jim Archer's office actually has a really difficult gear puzzle I mean it's difficult if you don't notice the cheat for it which is that there is a line on every gear etched into where the next gear is supposed to feed in if you don't notice that like how Sylvia did it drives you crazy 
Yeah, well, at least I was playing in junior detective mode, so it just automatically snapped in at a, like it would give you mercy and yeah. just snap it in if it was the correct one. This is at the it's pretty much the end game, and it's one of my favorite puzzles of all time. It's a board game with really cool rules, and it just breaks the theme. It's so unique. We've never seen a puzzle like that in any Nancy Drew game before. I mean, it's I know it's only game twelve, but still to this day we haven't. And it's there's a, a bunch of core rules that you can't break in order to get your piece. It's kind of set up like Candyland. There's like bridges you can cross, bridges you can't, but you have to play it really strategic so that you you move all of your pieces at the right time so that on your last move you're at the final location and you're not you can't go over either. So if you're three spaces away, you have to play a move three thing. You can't go like five. I don't. Know, it's like it's actually it has a lot to do with math. But it's not annoying math, you know? It's not no frass puzzle. It is not every day that a Nancy Drew puzzle makes math fun. Yeah, I appreciate the puzzle. But with that, puzzles in this game, you know, they're not that bad. There's a couple tedious ones here and there, but they met the 1930s theme really well, and there's nothing that, like, broke the game. Yeah. Moving on to music now. This game had an outstanding theme for music, in my opinion. Yeah, it was really catchy. There's gonna be times where, I mean, it happens when I'm in class, it happens when I'm working out, it happens all the time, but I'll just get the casual theme stuck in my head, the dun 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 Oh, dun, yep. Dun, dun, and it gets stuck in my head, and it, oh, it's so good. Man, it's just, the, the way that this game goes is that everything is just so catchy. I wouldn't call it my favorite game for Cinetrax, but this could be the catchiest one. And we're just gonna start playing specific examples here, but it's all very cool, jazzy, brassy, screwball music of the 1930s. And the driving themes are great too. Oh yeah. There's a really good fine line between like how they did driving themes and then how they did snooping, suspenseful type of themes. To kick off specifics for the music, it's the one and only that gets stuck in my head like an earworm. Amuse is the track name, and you hear it most at the end, but it's you can also hear it outside. I don't think I hear it anywhere else while I'm driving or chilling around outside in Titusville. But, uh, gosh, it's catchy. It's the trumpets, and it has some, like... It's what got I, a bell mute in it, I think. Yeah, it's something like that, but it is... It's good. It's, it's cheery. Very, it's very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it gets stuck in your head. It's such a groovy, swinging song. Here's a piece of it here. Next, I want to talk about Drive. Drive is a very good one for just running your errands and feeling like you really are putting your nose to the grindstone, being an errand boy for Tubby's Telegrams. And it's got the wood block in it. The wood block to me is what gives it such a cool, almost cartoony, but intense vibe. So love the wood block in this one. Here is Drive. Um, I like the sort of walking around track of humble, um, it almost makes you think of like it may, might be a pun with like humble pie. It's definitely one of the more jazzy tracks in the game. So the last track that I want to cover for this game is Mystery. This one really just goes hard to me because it's got some sort of clarinet or oboe or something that's got just a real almost snake-like snoopy vibe to it but at the same time it's got that same mute trumpet that all the other tracks are just blessed by where it's it's just this of <laughs> with the same instruments thematically as all the other tracks this one definitely conveys the idea of snooping around in a mystery so gotta love the mystery track here it is So now moving into the atmosphere, and I think that, well, I mean, it, it does the atmosphere really well, but the, the matter is whether or not it's the kind of atmosphere you want. Uh, as far as the little inn goes, I thought it was really cute and quaint, and it just felt very much like a home, something that Emily was going to inherit. But then, also with the atmosphere, we need to warp in 
just the times. Mm -hmm. Like the like the Great Depression and the toll it's taking on people. Yeah, it's it's more of a setting than atmosphere. Right. With that comes all the like cultural references, and we gotta talk about the phone calls with Mrs. Farthingham. Oh yeah, Mrs. Farthingham just crashing Bess and George's phone calls over and over. Oh, uh, that's one of the best parts of the game, honestly. How could you guys afford to use the phone in that economy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Bess, Marvin, and, and George talking about uh, them going to see this movie with some dream bone in it named John Wayne. <laughs> oh, I forgot that one. Oh my god. Hey, you know something that I've just now making connection to this game has an operator miss Joukowsky, who has a very similar kind of dialect to the operator from like haunted carousel the one who's filling oh. in for her cousin yeah they, they both have like the real strong what is it long island accents or yeah, something no, like you're that right. yeah otherwise i love miss Joukowsky in this game because eventually you meet her in person when you're delivering telegrams at the switchboard place wherever she is and if you've actually made a phone call before, you can have unique dialogue with her where she's like actually kind of nice to you and so like, oh, hi, Miss Drew, I connect, I put you through to your father a bit ago, remember? And I, I just, I love the little world building stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Again, I really, I, I love the, the fact that you can just like, even if it's throwaway lines and it's them telling you that they won't tip you, like it's, it's endearing to hear the town of Titusville talk to nancy drew i don't know right. i liked yeah. meeting all the little the little guys like mr w listen we stand small businessman mr waddell and yes. mr kowski yep. we do not stand mr phelp because he <laughs> made us fish oh man uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely the number one thing that adds to atmosphere the most. I mean, there's a nice secret passageway. It feels very like old school, traditional Nancy Drew, but it's interesting because it connects the Lilac Inn all the way to Topham's house, which once again throws a ton of shade on Mr. Topham. Topham's house is crazy. He says it himself. It's more of a museum than a house. It could be my favorite place in the game. It is so cool in there. I mean, it's, it's just one room for the most part, but there's all sorts of memorabilia, knickknacks from Josiah Crowley's time around the place. There's a bunch of stuff from the haunted carousel, like yeah. Rolf Kessler. There's he like has, a Rolf Kessler horse. He's got the carousel horse right in the corner of the room. So, what's everyone's favorite location? Mine's probably the museum. Yeah. And by that, I mean Topham's house. Mm. Oh, or it could be the barn, the top part of the barn, and that really cool cinematic of unlocking it for the first Ooh, time. Yeah, yeah the that's pretty. That's pretty fun. That's one of the coolest cutscenes ever. I mean, I have no cl clue how it works, like <laughs> it scientifically, <doesn't. laughs> but uh, I appreciate. Well, actually, it gets really old after two times. <laughs> it's cool. Uh, this game really did go hard on the cinematics, even like that really cool minecart ride thing with the uh, one golf ball in the secret hole. True, there I were, love that. There was a fair share of And there's an animation for even getting the golf ball club. Yeah. So hey, yeah. how about that? That's nice. There's cutscenes with uh, Emily running down the stairs once the fire starts. You get the cool one of her face looking around all like, like frantic. frantic. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You get one when you leave the inn in the car. Yeah. Um, there was yeah. a upgrade in cutscenes, especially when you compare it to Blackmore. Well, Blackmore, I don't want to touch on Blackmore now, but they had the really cool midnight cutscene. I don't know. Okay, uh, here's a hot take for this game, and I'm pretty sure this is going to trigger some people. I think this game did a much better map than Alibi and Ashes. Because, for Ooh. one thing, Alibi and Ashes... What? Yeah, because... No, no. I mean, I don't mean map in, like, the sense... Did you just... like paying for gas? and dodging potholes. <laughs> I prefer that to just literally clicking. I will say that the one in Alibi and Ashes made me like a little bit nauseous, the way it would just zoom all the way like across town. At least this way, the town was nice and small. I could like just sort of get over those corners and drive around. But if they, now if they gave me a real map, an actual map, then I would, I would love, I would love the driving in this game. Yeah, it, but come on. It was just disappointing the map, the map, to me in Alibi. <sighs> That there was nothing else going on. Well, I tell you, I did not like it as the end game challenge. Segwaying into end game. All right, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you have that transition then, Julian. So moving into the end game, uh, there's a lot of really weird stuff that happens in the end game that I didn't normally remember. And I think that the weirdest and probably coolest to me is Thisbe, Flute, and Pyramus. So this is with Old Man Josiah's ham radio that he keeps in the loft of his barn. There are, once you repair the radio with Waddell's jewelry, cutting you a new blank or whatever, you need to transmit to three different other ham radio operators who are just luckily by their radios. And you find out that Josiah had like pen pals of a sort. And 
basically, he gave these people names that for some reason they agreed to go by of Thisbe, Pyramus, and Flute, which were all names from, uh, what was the Shakespearean play? It was Midsummer Night's Dream? Uh, mid yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yep. So I, I haven't read so much Shakespeare in my time. But uh, basically, he would call these people and rehearse with them over the phone saying that he was going to be in a big play of it. And Puck, I mean, Puck as he called himself to these people, Josiah, uh, he was a big theater guy. And he would always tell them that he was trying to practice his lines for the big play he was going to be in. And so what he would do is he would read a line to them, and then they would read a line back to him. And so what Nancy does post-mortem is she fills in on Josiah's behalf, and it's really a sad part of the game, where she gets to meet all these anonymous people. One of them's just like this big, butch, Long Island guy who sounds like he's in the inner city. One of them's just like this real quivery old lady who seems real upset to hear that, jo that Josiah's passed away. She thought that his play got canceled, and he was just too sad to talk to her because of that. And the other one's just like this snooty dude. He's just like, oh, so you mean he wasn't actually rich like he'd led me on to believe? Anyhow, Nancy gets all these lines from them that have to do with all sorts of uh, hobo code sign language things that you put in to open up this box that gives another puzzle and stuff like that. Bottom line, the way that it ends is you get a golf ball that you play on the mini golf course and you have to get a hole in, run, a hole in one in one of the levels. And once you do that, uh, Nancy finds the final key to another safety deposit box. Only this one is under Clara. Yeah, Clara's name. The old lady who used to visit Jim Archer and took a real shine to her and was so sweet to her. This is where it has a real funny reveal that <laughs> Clara was actually Josiah Crowley just cross-dressing, <laughs> trying to fool Jim Archer. Just it's... Well, helmet. and Jim Archer was fooled, yeah. to be fair. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. <laughs> it's just real he, funny to me. Josiah, he put a lot of, like, just time and effort into just making a ton of, like, puzzles surrounding, mm -hmm. like, just his lo his will and the location of it. If there's just, like, a brief moment of awe that Josiah put his real will in Clara's safety deposit box, to even be fair, though they were the same person. To be fair, it was kind of foreshadowed, because em Emily said that he showed up as his, his, her great grandma. aunt great aunt that was it and she couldn't tell the difference for two days yeah. <laughs> are you kidding me it's, he's, he's like he, he, he must have been an actual really good actor so yeah just like tobias funke from rest of the moment <laughs> <laughs> literally <laughs> just what was it uh mary poppins or something or mrs Dalton? <laughs> yes man yeah okay so bottom line Inside this safe deposit box, next to the will, is a picture. Real convenient that this picture is here. It is a picture of Emily, of Gloria Crandall and Jane Willoughby. The real Jane Willoughby. And this is where we get into the very unique and untraditional crime that Jane Willoughby commits in this game. And that is, she is an imposter. She is not actually Jane Willoughby. She is... I don't even know if we ever find out who she is. Anyhow, I'm gonna... Julian was the one who suffered through it both times, so I'm gonna go ahead and surrender the end game challenge to him. He he can explain uh the the uh, the egregious crime that it is. This is like Yanni Volkstaya on <laughs> oh, yeah. automotive. No, that was too easy. This is worse. Um, so it all starts. You're pulling up. You have this little dialogue, and she's like, "Well, it was swell knowing you, sister." When she says, <laughs> "Oh, you, I just saw a picture of Jane Willoughby, <laughs> the real Jane Willoughby." Yeah, he gets some classic sass, but uh, this is where things get terrible. <laughs> uh, the game instantly second chances you if she gets off your screen just barely. And it's brutal. Because, it's a car chase. Because it throws you into this. You're not expecting to be just into this car chase in an instant. And she takes off at full speed. And there's been times where, like, it starts... And then a second later, I'm at the game over screen. <laughs> Dude, I remember Argofump raging on this so hard in his old classic yeah, walkthrough. You have to take really precise turns. You have to cut corners really well. And then there's a, there's a real lack of direction. You had to really be paying attention to the map in order to find out what you're supposed to do at the end. And Basically, you, you head her off at the state line. You head her off at the pass. Headley Lamar, I hate that cliche. Bottom line, once you do it, she crashes into a conveniently placed pie truck. And, uh, yeah. Culprit foil. End game letter. What what I think is sort of upsetting is that this whole like sequence is triggered by like just clicking on the picture and realizing that Jane Willoughby is an imposter. You just sort of rush right back to the the inn, but like 
it sort of ignores that he, that the will was also in oh, yeah. the lockbox. Yeah. Like, which is Nancy... kind of, um, hello, Nancy, there's money in there. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great point, is the will is totally overshadowed there. And that's what you're finding the entire game. I don't know. So, in the end game letter, I think we resolve that, uh, what? Emily Crandall gets her business going again, and, like, with the money brought in from the will, she's able to get a new stove, and the fire damage is repaired, and the lilac and Jim business. Archer gets some money. Yeah, Jim Archer Richard Topham money. contests the will, though. He's still like, oh, mine is real, so I don't know what's going on with that, because he kind of set up shop in yeah. the house. Richard Topham spends the rest of his mortal life in a courtroom arguing for money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I guess Jane goes to jail. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I, I guess, like... She definitely stole the jewels, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Surprised yeah, that, that was her. By now, yeah. Unless it was Topham. In which case, prison. <laughs> I think it's time we rank this bad boy. Alright, mm. time to go into the ranking series. The way that we like to rank our games is not with scales of numbers 1 through 10, because, you know, some Nancy Drews are better on paper than they are in practice, but instead we like to give them letter grades. I know I say this every time, but I promise this is the last time, guys. So, uh, A is great, F is terrible, and then the S tier at the top is reserved for the best of the best. Who's, who's going first this time? I will go first. So, sheesh, it... Overall thoughts on the game, I mean, I appreciate what they were going for, it, uh, it gets a little illogical at times, but I think they went a little too heavy on the satire, and it wasn't all that too good of a mystery, especially when you only had like, what, two real suspects? You can instantly rule Emily out, Jim Archer shouldn't, I, I have my own grievances with Jim Archer that I won't go on a rant on now for, but either way... Uh, this game really felt like it was missing something, and I, it's hard to put my tongue on exactly what it is, but at the same time, I just didn't have the most fun playing it, too. Things got way too tedious driving around for the 50th time, and I don't know. That's just my honest opinion, and I think that this game is a C. Alright, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just second that, because I'm also giving it a C. To me, this game is the most mediocre Nancy Drew. That's not to say worst, but it's just like... It's so simple, and parts of it are just so intentionally goofy, and at the end of the day, you can't hate it, because, like, it seems like its intention was to be a fun game. Not necessarily funny, but just, like, kind of cheerful and charming, and cheesy, of course. But, really, I can't give it anything better than a C, because there's nothing remarkable about it, there's no suspects in this game I'm really attached to, some of the puzzles are cool and replayable, Really, the music is just the saving grace. If, if the music for this game wasn't so catchy, it would just be dead in the water, forgotten. Yeah, it really the helps the atmosphere. Yeah. So I'm also giving it a C. Okay, I... Uh, I think the characters are a little bit weak. Um, I mean, they're, they're, pro they're fine, they're passable, but I think all of them just lack a little more nuance, and like... They just, they just don't seem to, like, interact with each other and, like, I don't know, be a part of each other's lives. Like, I mean, the bond between Josiah Crowley and everyone else is way stronger, so it just feels like... And I think this is a problem with them mixing four plots from four books together. It's like... That's a good point. Yeah. You, 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 you kind of set yourself up for a little bit of a chaotic mess if you're only going to have one singular you know, culprit. Sylvia, your point about, like, Nancy not doing anything about finding the will at the end was so true, and it's something I never gave much thought about, is it's like, that's what the entire focus of the game was. It's right there, Nancy. But it... Well... With that, C's across the board for the old clock. That concludes our review for Secret of the Old Clock, then. Now, this is gonna be our last review for a while, unless we get a couple of other games coming through, but that's that's unlikely. Bottom line, we are going to have a new series coming to the channel soon, the ranking series, and we'll have we'll probably make a small upload coming in the next couple of days explaining how it's gonna work and what you can expect coming from the channel. It's gonna be a lot of fun, it's gonna take a lot of time to make, and we hope that you guys stay tuned for it. Otherwise, thank you so much for following us through this series. We've reviewed 33 games now, I believe. All 33 Ooh. of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. It's um... interactive. If you keep making them, we'll keep reviewing them. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> but man, it's been it's been such a journey so far. Julian and I started this mid towards the beginning of quarantine, and we met Sylvia along the way, and it's it's just been a fun time. 
and we hope to keep on finding more content we can pump out on this franchise and other franchises like it. So yeah, thank if you made it to this point in the commentary, uh, say uh, vote for Holt in the comments. That's just a secret for <laughs> you. all of you guys right who made now. it to this point. Man, v vote for Holt, gang. So with that being said, everybody, be sure to stay tuned for an update coming on the channel. And thanks for watching, and don't forget to vote for Holt. Vote for Holt.